Good morning, everyone. My name is Ellen Vera, and I'm a specialist with our provider outreach and education team of WPS Government Health Administers. On the call with me today is Leanne Foster, who's going to be watching our chat. You want to enter any of your questions or comments into the chat. We have a lot of information that we're going to be providing for you today. Um, so we may not get to all of the questions. If we don't, we will be preparing a document that will send send out to all of the attendees for today with the questions and the answers that we were not able to answer in that chat. The first thing that we have for you is our disclaimer. This is a tool for you. Your documentation, the CMS rules and regulations, really determine the level of service that you're going to submit into Medicare. Now, Medicare rules do change often. I'm sure you've noticed that CMS has published the proposed rule for 2025. Um, there are some e &M, uh, uh, services and things, telehealth, other services that go along with evaluation and management services that are part of that proposed rule. So we'll have to watch for the final rule, which should come out sometime in November, uh, to determine exactly what those changes are going to be. You do want to look at that proposed rule because you can submit comments on the information CMS has in there. They'll be taking comments, I believe it is through the 1st of uh, September, um, and they do evaluate all of the comments that are there. So we will provide responses to your questions either during this presentation or, like I said, in a document following the presentation. But again, the Medicare rules, what CMS has published, will determine final coverage. And then that last information there, CMS does prohibit recording of this presentation for profit-making purposes. We are recording this, and this will be available probably within a week and a half, two weeks, on our website under our Encore presentations. And the neat thing about what's on the website is that it has a player built in. So if, if your uh, company, because of security reasons or whatever, does not allow you to use YouTube, on your work computer, that player will help you to, to re-listen to anything that we've done. And then at the same time, it will go on to our YouTube channel so you can take a look at that. So what are the things that we're going to be talking about here today? Well, we're going to be talking about choosing your level of service when you're billing for evaluation and management codes. There are three different parts of this problem, data, and risk, and those are the things that we're going to be talking about. So what we have up for you on the screen now is just a list of the acronyms that we're going to be using as we go throughout this presentation today. We wanted to provide this to you just as a resource. We know that uh, Medicare does tend to be an alphabet soup. Um, so there's all kinds of acronyms. We wanted to gather them all up in one spot for you. So the first thing that we have then is medical necessity. It really is the, the first determinant that you want to look at when looking at your medical record documentation. Is the service medically necessary for the patient? So what this means then is the services have to be reasonable and necessary to treat an illness or injury or to improve the functioning of a malformed body member. So that's the first thing Medicare is going to be looking at if any of the medical review contractors look at your documentation. What was the reason for that encounter? What makes that encounter reasonable and necessary for that patient on that particular day. And again, this is all based on your documentation. We did have a pre-submitted question that really kind of goes along with this. And the question was on uh, surgical clearance. Well, the patient has an illness or injury, obviously, that's going to necessitate that surgery. 
but is it medically necessary to perform a surgical clearance? The person who's providing that surgical clearance is not treating whatever the problem is that is going to necessitate that service. So what is it within your documentation that shows that the patient needs to have and medically needs to have that surgical clearance? For some of your patients who have uh, additional diagnoses and things going on, surgical clearance may make sense for them. For other patients, maybe not so much. Um, and so what are you, what is it that you're treating? What are you diagnosing or improving the functioning of a malformed body member? That's what we're going to need to see within that documentation itself. So now let's talk about some of the American Medical Association changes. You can see here that the AMA really has drastically changed the information concerning evaluation and management services and how you choose that level of service. So January 1 of 2021 is where they started with office or other outpatient services. And then January of 2023 is when they made the changes to all other categories of service. So based on these changes, you are choosing your level of service based on either time or the medical decision making. And again, that medical decision making is the problem. It's the data that has been analyzed. And then it is the risk to that patient from the medical decision making that you're doing. Now, there are two exceptions to that. For emergency room, you use medical decision making only. Time, um, however much time you're spending is not used to choose your level of service. For critical care services, it's just the opposite. You only bill based on time, not based on medical decision making. And we will have uh, webinars coming up on all of the different categories of E&M services, and you can find those advertised on our live events webpage. So let's look then at the, the levels of the service. So most categories of services have four different levels, straightforward, low, moderate, and high. Some of the categories only have three where they combine the straightforward and low. In order to choose a level of service, you must meet or exceed two of the three levels for that component. So what we mean by that is that if you have a low problem, but you have moderate level of, of data and you have moderate level of risk, then moderate would be the level of service that you would choose. One of the things that um, is very different about the way that the AMA has, has designed the instructions for these is that in a lot of cases, it's going to be more difficult for your billers and your coders especially to determine the level of service without additional information from that provider. Under the 95 and 97 documentation guidelines, which is what we used to use, as billers and coders, you, you could do that a lot easier. Under this, your physicians really need to document what those levels are, and especially when we get to the risk category, and you want to be having those conversations with your practitioners for them to, to provide that documentation, and it really goes back to the proof of thought. Now, you know, you don't have to, your doctors and your practitioners don't have to put everything, obviously, that they're thinking within the documentation, but they have to have enough in there so that, that you people, as coders and billers, can then find that documentation in order to choose a level of service. So the first thing that we're going to talk about then is the time. So the time is identified within the code descriptor, and it will say you must meet at least X amount of minutes. When you're using time to choose your level of service, it's time on that calendar date. 
Now, this includes both the face-to-face -face time that you have with that patient, and it's also non-face-to-face -face time, which I'll show you in just a second. You want to educate your physicians and practitioners to document that non-face-to-face -face time and the work that they're doing. You don't want to leave money on the table. If you're choosing your procedure code based on time, um, you, you want them to include that time because that can make a difference in the level of service that you're choosing. The other thing that you want to see there is that time is by the practitioner. Um, so this is your, your non-physician practitioner, your MD or your DO, et cetera. And then you want to document specific time. We don't expect the providers to stopwatch themselves, but they do need to be fairly accurate in the time that they are reporting. Um, using terminology like you know, I spent approximately X amount of minutes or I spent this amount of minutes or more or something like that really is, is not going to assist you. One of the things that CMS has in their internet only manual is that when Macs are reviewing and the documentation or the, cho the choosing of the level of service is based on time, then MACs need to review that time for accuracy. Now, you know, obviously we were not there. Okay, so, you know, if the doctor says 20 minutes or 40 minutes, you know, we weren't there. But the documentation needs to support it. So, for an example, if your physician documents, you know, they spent 40 minutes with the patient and the documentation doesn't look like it would take 40 minutes in order to do, then, then Medicare may have a question on that if we're looking at that documentation. So you just want to look at, at, you know, how much time is being spent and the documentation that goes along with that. One of the questions that we receive all the time is, um, you know, our time would indicate a moderate level of service our medical decision making would indicate a, a low level of service. What do we do? Well, you can choose your procedure code based on time. So if your time equates to a moderate level of service, then bill that. It's entirely appropriate, even if your medical decision making does not, because you can choose based on either one. You can choose based on which one is more advantageous to you. If your time gets you a higher level of procedure code, as long as your documentation supports it, use that. Again, don't leave money on the table. If your medical decision making allows you to do the higher level of procedure code, but your time would indicate a lower level, use that medical decision making. That's what the rules are. You can use one or the other. One of the questions that we've received is, do you have to sign it, sign your physicians and non-physician practitioners have to sign it on the same date of the encounter in order to use time? And the answer to that is no. However, you would use the time only on that calendar date. The time it takes that physician on another date to review the um, uh, transcription, something along those lines to sign it, you wouldn't actually count that time for that. So here is just a list of some of the things that you can include in that non-face-to-face -face time. You're preparing to see the patient. So your physician or practitioner is reviewing test results. They're, um, you know, looking at what their previous note said. They're obtaining and reviewing separately obtained history. Um, there was a conversation with the, the uh, family member, and now the doctor is reviewing that information. You can count that. Performing the medically appropriate exam is part of that. The time that it takes to order medications, tests, etc. As long as it's done by that practitioner, then you can count that. Another thing you can count here is when your doctors are referring the patient to another practitioner, 
or communicating with that other practitioner when it's not separately reported. There's an interprofessional consultation procedure codes that we have out there that you could, could submit for that type of communication. If you're not submitting that separately, then you can count that. I really want you to pay attention to that second bullet point there too, documenting that clinical information. So when that practitioner is um, dictating his or her medical record, if they're entering it into the medical record themselves, they're actually typing it in, that's non-face-to-face -face time and that time counts. Make sure your doctors and your practitioners are looking at that and are recording that time. Independently interpreting results and communicating that to the patient, that also is non-face-to-face -face time when it's not separately reported. So if you're not billing for the professional component of the chest x-ray, for an example, then you can count that time as part of your time for your ENM. And then also care coordination. Again, this is where you may be talking with other practitioners. It may be where your practitioner is talking with a community agency um, in order to get the patient you know, services from them or providing them with information. Again, as long as it's not separately reported. Now, here's some of the time that you don't count. Um, again, if you're separately reporting something, if you have travel time, that's not uh, part of your E&M service. And then if you're a teaching physician, teaching that is general in nature and is not specific to that patient, then you would not count that either. So what we have up for you now are just some examples of some different categories of procedure codes. And you can see here on the screen, we've underlined the time elements. So it, for example, that 99202, 15 minutes must be met or exceeded. For the 99307, 10 minutes must be met or exceeded. 35 minutes for the 99232. So as long as your practitioner has documented that time, either face-to-face -face or non-face-to-face, -face, then you can choose that procedure code without in including the medical decision-making information that you have there. So let's look at um, separately reported services. Again, uh, you don't report those. If you're billing for the professional component, of a chest x-ray, that interprofessional consultation, you're not going to include that time. Another situation that we see quite often is that documentation shows that 47 minutes, but 47 minutes includes both the procedure and an E&M. Well, in that situation, how really are you going to determine the time that was spent on that separately reported procedure and the E&M. So in the documentation, the physician would really need to separate that time. You also wanna look at situations where the practitioner may be engaging the patient in other types of conversation. Uh, maybe they're both avid fishermen. And so they're talking about their latest, you know, fishing activities or something. Um, one of my previous physicians, whenever I would go in to talk with her, we always had a conversation about Medicare and what was happening with Medicare. Uh, she knew that I worked for a Medicare contractor. Um, so in her documentation, if you know she was billing based on time, she would have to exclude that conversation from the actual time of the encounter itself. So what does documentation, what does Medicare expect in that documentation? Well, just what we've talked about, we're gonna evaluate the patient's medical needs versus that time spent. If there isn't anything obvious, you know, you build uh, 120 minutes and the patient has a cold, okay? If there isn't anything obviously wrong, then Medicare's going to accept your time. 
but we would have to evaluate that if we're evaluating your medical records. So we'd be looking at those activities and then asking ourselves whether it makes sense for that patient. So the next thing that we're gonna talk about then are the prolonged care codes. Couple of things on this one. Uh, the procedure code here is G2212. This is for your office and other outpatient codes. And you can see here in the examples that you have to exceed the procedure code limit by at least 15 minutes. And then in order to build this procedure code, you have to have a full 15 minutes of additional time. And then on the chart itself, it, you know, it kind of goes up. It shows you when you can build one unit of that, two units of that. The fact that um, it doesn't necessarily give three or, or more units, it just tells you that you have to have a full 15 minutes for that. Again, we don't expect the practitioners to stopwatch, you know, but we do expect the, the time that is reflected to be accurate. Again, you know, don't leave money on the table. You want to count that. Now, we are aware that CMS has changed some descriptions of their procedure codes in 2024. CMS has not yet changed the prolonged care code descriptions for those. And so what Medicare contractors have to go with is what is in the CMS information, which is what you have available here on your chart. The next slide that we have is talking about inpatient services. Um, and you can only use the prolonged care code when you're using time, just as a reminder for you. Um, so what we have up here are the, the chart limits for the initial and the subsequent procedure code. And you can see there it's 90 minutes in order to be able to bill that G0316 procedure code. And then you would have to have that full 15 minutes in order to do that. Take a look, however, at the same admit and discharge procedure code listed there. The time that you're going to count to choose your level of service is on the date of the encounter. So you provided the, you admitted and discharged today. So that's the time you would use to choose your level of service. Any additional time, either today or up to three days following today, then you can look for that prolonged care service procedure code. Again, you know, make sure you're documenting that. We also have the prolonged procedure code there for uh, nursing facility codes, and this is that G0317. Again, full 15 minutes. However, look at this one, or look at these two. It's one day before the date of service and up to three days after. Not your E&M service, but for your prolonged care services. Excuse me. And then we have the one again for the home services. This one also is a little bit different. Again, full 15 minutes, have to go at least 15 minutes past the time for the procedure code. For these codes, it's three days before the date of your service, which chooses your level of B&M, and then up to seven days after in order to look at using that prolonged care service. So what is some additional information then on time? Well, for critical care services, you can see there it's the first 30 to 74 minutes for the 99291. In order to build the 99292, you have to have a full 30 minutes past that 74. So that, uh, that would be starting then at the 104 minutes, and then you have to have a full 30 minutes in order to build that. For the discharge management codes, and this tends to be one that gets denied on medical review if we're looking at that quite a bit, the first 30 minutes is the 99238 for an inpatient, 99315 for nursing facility, 
That one we don't have too much trouble with. The next one though, the 239 and the 316, has to have time indicated and it has to be each additional full 30 minutes. Um, if you do 45 minutes, you don't have an additional full 30 minutes and therefore you can't build that 99239. What we see most often is that there just isn't time that's uh, attached to that. So the next thing we're gonna talk about then is the medical decision making. And so there are three elements of that, number and complexity of problems addressed at the encounter, and that terminology is important. Amount and complexity of data to be reviewed and analyzed. And then the risk of complications and or morbidity or mortality of the patient management. And I think that one more than anything else is, is really where you've got to go back to your practitioners and their proof of thought on and what they're thinking is the risk to that patient from that medical decision that they're, they're going to be making. So let's talk about the problem then. Well, what you have up on your screen is the definition by the AMA. So it's a disease, condition, illness, injury, et cetera. You also see on here that it could be a symptom, it could be a sign or a finding. So it doesn't necessarily have to have a diagnosis at the time of the encounter. The patient may come into you and they're complaining of abdominal pain. Well, that's your symptom. You may not know today, even following the encounter, exactly what's causing that abdominal pain, but you can still use that as your particular problem. You'll notice on here that the terminology or the definition says addressed. That's very important. When you're talking about the problems, and especially with your Medicare patients, either they're over 65, um, they're on Medicare because of disability. Hang on one second. Um, and so they could have a very high list of, of problems that they have going on. But what is it that you're actually addressing today? Um, patient comes into you with a, a rash on their elbow. So they have that rash. They also have diabetes. They have congestive heart failure. They have arthritis. Well, in the documentation for today, obviously you're, you're going to be addressing or the medical record will be addressing that rash on the elbow. If it's not addressing any of the additional problems that that patient may have, then you don't include those when you're choosing your level of problem. Now, in the example I gave, we did have diabetes that was included in there. If that patient's diabetes is going to affect that rash, maybe in the time of healing, uh, maybe you need to look closer for infections, something along those lines, and you're addressing the diabetes in connection with that rash, then you can count that. The other services, the other uh, problems that the patient may have, unless you're addressing them, you wouldn't count those. And then this gives you additional information on the problem that is addressed, that it's not just that it's in the list, um, but it is what your physician or practitioner is addressing within the medical decision making for this particular encounter. We have a, a question um, about the level of service following a successful kidney transplant. Well, there's several different things that could go on there. Number one, are you the surgeon? And is it part of the global surgery package? If it is, of course, then you would not bill for that separately. If you're not the surgeon, then what is the problem that you're addressing? Now, obviously, a patient who has received a kidney transplant or any other type of transplant for that matter is going to be followed looking for infections, 
looking for injection or rejections of the transplant itself. But what is what are you addressing during this particular encounter? Um, if it's a hospitalist during a, a inpatient stay following that transplant, again, what is it that you are addressing and managing during that particular encounter? So what we have for you here is just a, a picture of what's in the AMA information for a st straightforward problem, one self-limited or minor problem. So when we're looking at this, um, for a patient with hypertension, for an example, a cold could meet this definition. For a patient with chronic, uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, a cold may not be a minor problem for that patient. So it's the, it's the problem and it is the entire patient, whatever else is going on with that particular patient that could affect that medical decision making. If your physician's not indicating that, you need to go back to them and have them tell you um, what type of problem it is for that individual patient. The next one that we have is a picture of the low from the AMA information. And you can see here that we've got several things listed. Two or more self-limited or minor problems. One stable chronic, acute uncomplicated illness, et cetera. And we'll kind of talk about these as we go through. So let's talk about that one of those. This is a stable chronic illness. Well, the first thing is the definition by the AMA and also the Centers for Disease Control is that chronic means a year, means 12 months, either expected to last uh, at least one year or until the death of the patient or has lasted at least one year already. Stable means that the patient is at goal. So they're where you want them to be. Their A1C level is where you want it. The hypertension, the blood pressure uh, recording, that's where you want it. Even if the patient has been at the same level, you know, let's say their blood pressure is 150 over 80, and they've been at that for the past year and a half, is that where your physician wants them? If they want them at 120 or 115 over 70, whatever the new guidelines are, they're not at goal, so they're not stable. And so you would need to choose one of the other levels um, or the other definitions that we have in here. As part of that, though, your medical record would show the patient's goal. Where does your physician want that patient to be? Acute uncomplicated illness or injury. Um, so let's talk about this one. An example could be a patient with a cold, but the over-the-counter medication is not helping. Uh, the physician could be considering other types of medications, steroids maybe, et cetera. Um, maybe the patient has a rash due to poison ivy, but the itch, itch and the rash are not resolving, but they're really kind of not getting any worse either. Those are some examples that could be part of this one. Uncomplicated would be that physician or practitioner's determination for that patient. Remember, we talked earlier about the patient with COPD and the cold. That could be complicated, um, you know, just based on everything else that's going on with the patient. We have the example for you of stable acute illness. Uh, patient has a sinus infection, practitioner started treatment, and while it's not totally resolved, the patient is responding as expected. We did have a, a pre-submitted question is, can we move to moderate when we have more than one stable acute. And you would need to meet the, the explanation and, and what the AMA has for the moderate or high. Look at the illness or the injury to, to determine if they meet that. If it's just stable and acute without anything else, then it would not meet, would not necessitate the move to moderate. Multiple problems of a lower sever severity 
may create a higher risk due to the interaction, it won't create necessarily a higher level of problem. So the next one that we have here then, um, requiring a higher level of care, this could be the patient goes into the emergency room with confusion. Um, the patient's dizzy, they've indicated this has been going on um, for several days. So we decide that, or your practitioner decides they're going to admit them um, to observation, or they're going to admit them to uh, an inpatient status based on what it is that they have going on. It can also be in a hospital situation where you're now placing that patient within a critical care unit. And so that could be uh, another example of this one. The next thing that we have then is the moderate level. And again, you know, the pre-submitted question that we had, you wanna look at the definitions and see where your problems that are being addressed fall into this. You could have a higher level of risk, depending on what's going on with that patient, uh, but you really want to look at the definitions that the AMA has here. One of the pre-submitted questions that we had is the, the patient is there for pain in both the lumbar area and pain from migraines. Well, you want to look at your documentation. Are you treating the migraine? Are you treating the lumbar problem? or are you treating the pain? If you're treating the pain, this would be one um, area or one problem, not even, I'm sorry, I can't talk today. It would be one problem even though you have pain in multiple areas. So let's talk about then that chronic illness with exacerbation. Remember uh, the example we gave your patient with high blood pressure, their patient, their high blood pressure has been the same for the past year and a half, but it's not at goal. Therefore, it meets the chronic illness with exacerbation. So your physician or practitioner is looking at how can I get this patient's blood pressure down? How can I get them to goal? Um, another situation that you could have is the patient comes into you, maybe it's a new patient visit, they're telling you they've had back pain for the past year. Well, now we have chronic because it's lasted at least a year. We don't know what's causing it yet, and we don't know exactly how we're going to treat it yet. But since they still have pain, and obviously it's your practitioner's goal not for them not to have pain, that would fall into this category. Now, this one gets a little confusing for providers sometimes. It's an undiagnosed new problem with an uncertain prognosis. And all of those particular uh, words in there are important in order to determine this one. Number one, it's undiagnosed. So that means no one has told the patient yet that they have this. It's a new problem to that patient. That determination is based on the patient, not the fact that it's a new problem or a new patient to your physicians or practitioners. In addition to that, the patient has an uncertain prognosis because we don't necessarily what's, know what's going on at this point. Um, so for an example, the patient presents to the ER with heart palpitations, they're sweating, they have shortness of breath. These are the problems that are being addressed. This is a new problem to the patient. Um, we don't know for sure what's causing it, however. Um, it, as part of the history, though, we it, it's we found out that the patient just won the lottery, so I think I would have those same symptoms. But the patient has this differential diagnosis we don't know what the prognosis is going to be. Are they just excited? You know, and so they're having this. Are they really having a heart attack or some other type of heart condition going on? So what we determine is that the patient isn't having a heart attack. They're just, you know, stressed and excited about having all that new money. It can still fall into this category. Patient didn't have it before. 
we don't know exactly what's going on yet. And based on the signs or symptoms that we're looking at, we have an uncertain prognosis for this patient. Acute illness with systemic symptoms. This is also one that we get a lot of questions on. What are the systemic symptoms? Well, they're going to be, it equates to the systems that you would look at during an exam, respiratory, cardiovascular, et cetera. So for an example, if, if you have um, a patient who's coming into you with a cold, but that's also causing additional respiratory um, uh, symptoms, or it's causing cardiovascular, um, it's causing musculoskeletal problems because they're coughing so much, then you have that those systemic systems, or symptoms rather. You would not count general ones. Again, patient comes in with a cold, they're tired, they've got a fever, they have body aches that are not uh, classified as pain, then it would not be the systemic conditions. Acute complicated injury. Um, in this one, the patient uh, presents with a laceration of the scalp. So based on the information that the, uh, from the patient, the practitioner is also performing a neurological exam. Patients unconscious, struggling to breathe on their own. Uh, patient is presenting after a fall. Maybe they could be experiencing additional problems with balance or gait. So all of that then would go into the complication of this particular injury. We've got a laceration on the scalp, obviously acute uh, injury. And then we have these other complications that we don't know for sure exactly what caused that fall, um, et cetera. One of the questions that we, received earlier was how do you determine acute complicated versus uncomplicated? Well, that's your physician or practitioner's determination based on what they're doing for that patient. Is this a complication? Um, is it going to take more thought, et cetera? That can increase your level of service. The next thing that we have then is the high level. And again, it's just a picture of what's in the uh, CPT book. Severe exacerbation, this again is going to be based on your practitioner and what they have documented within their medical record. Um, for an example, the blood pressure or I'm sorry, the blood sugar has shot to 300. Um, maybe another medication is causing that drastic change in their blood sugar. Um, we have an example of a COPD patient with smoke from uh, forest fires. Um, this could include not only evaluating medication, but possibly placing that patient on oxygen until the, the smoke kind of dissipates. But it is your physician or practitioner who's going to determine this. The last or the next one here, um, an example of this one could be treating for a urinary tract infection, and it's possible that this is moving to sepsis. Um, you're treating for uncontrolled diabetes, causing severe breathing problems. Um, it, you would have a further examination and treatment decisions for patients at this particular level. Um, you wanna look at the documentation you want your uh, physicians and practitioners to document how is this posing a threat to their life or to a bodily function. And if it's in that documentation, then we can support this level of service. Now, the next thing that we're gonna talk about is data. Um, and data's a, a little easier, um, I think, to look at than, than the problem or the risk category. But in the categories, you can see that for straightforward, you don't have anything or very little that you're, um, that you're looking at. For the low, you have to meet requirements of at least one of the two categories. That's tests or documents, and you have to have two, and then assessment requiring an independent historian. Then when we move on to moderate, 
Again, we have the examples for you there. This information is uh, within the CPT book itself. So let's talk about some of these. Well, data analyzed means that this is going back to proof of thought. The, the practitioner is reviewing and analyzing that data to help determine the medical plan for that patient. When you see the patient in June, you analyze the INR tests, and then this will help you determine what your plan going forward uh, for that patient could be. It could be keeping everything the same. It could be making changes. When you order a test, the AMA and Medicare is assuming that you are going to analyze the results of that test. If you didn't plan on analyzing those results, then it goes back to the medical necessity of that particular test. Tests are defined here for you. Um, imaging, laboratory, psychometric, or psych, uh, psych, oh, psych, physiologic, I can say that word, um, services. So this is going to be a unique test based on the procedure code. So if you're doing a lab test, for an example, and that lab test is also part of a panel, that would only be a single test. So that goes based on the procedure code, and is it actually part of something else? Um, if you are uh, doing pulse oximetry, that is not considered a test by the AMA. The AMA does state that if you're ordering and performing the test by the practitioner or a member of the same group, it would not count separately. And so what we're talking about there is if, if you're going to bill for the performance of that professional component, so that would be your imaging services, you would not um, include that in with your test, because again, that's separately reported. If you're ordering the, the technical service, then that could. Um, one of the pre-submitted questions we had is, can we count the same test multiple times when we're performing for different reasons? And the answer to that is no. Um, you know, the responses are gonna come back the same. The next thing that we have is unique to find, and again, that goes back to that procedure code. Now, a couple of things on unique, however. If, if in today's encounter, you're ordering INR testing for the next six months, today you're gonna to count the order and the review of an INR test as part of your level of service. When you get to your visit six months from now, you can count another INR test because you are analyzing that information on that particular day. Now, you wouldn't count all of the additional five that you provided, but you can count that additional test. In addition to this, if you're looking at medical records from another entity, say that you have reviewed records from the last ER visits from ABC Hospital, this is one unique source. If you're analyzing the testing from the ER visits, you can also count those as a unique source. The AMA, uh, in a later slide, I placed a link where the AMA stated that in a webinar that they have provided. So you get the records from ABC, you count those once, you're also reviewing the data, the testing from ABC Hospital. You can also count that as a unique source. A unique source would not count someone within your own office or with whom you share uh, medical records. It would have to be someone um, in a different specialty or within a different group. So this is the definition that CMS has of external. Um, these are the external notes and things that you would be looking at. You would not count the review of your previous notes in your medical decision making. Um, one of the questions that we receive on this one a lot of times is, during today's encounter, the nurse practitioner ordered a test. 
So they count the order and they count the review of that test in today's encounter. The MD or the DO sees the patient a couple months later and they review that test result. Can that MD count it? And the answer to that is yes, because they're different specialties. An MD and a DO are not the same specialties as your nurse practitioner. The next thing that we have is discussion defined, and this is your discussion between other practitioners. It's a real-time discussion. Now that could be, you know, you're actually talking to them. It could be you're sending them text messages, emails, um, something along those lines. So this could be the cardiologist discussing an aspect of the patient's care with their internal medicine practitioner. Um, as you can see here, though, it's not an exchange of notes within the medical record itself. It's an actual interaction between those two practitioners. It doesn't necessarily have to be on the date of the encounter. Couple of things on that, though. It would need to, to start either on that day of encounter or within the next day or so. And then if you're going to include this in with your E&M service, you would not be able to bill for that E&M until that interaction and that discussion has been concluded. So again, we have information on um, your levels of service. I do want to bring up um, for the low level here where it has assessment requiring an independent historian. Number one, this is, is not a translator. Okay, so if, if the patient and the practitioner speak different languages, this does not count for that. If it's a, a daughter or a wife that's come, you know, with the patient and they're providing information, you also would not count that unless you have documentation that the patient's information is, is not to be trusted as either complete or accurate. So, you know, if you have a, a wife that's coming with the husband and the wife's doing all the talking, unless you have reason to believe that the husband cannot, can, cannot, and that's the word, cannot provide you with good information, then you would not count uh, as an independent historian. So we've got information for you here on the low category. Um, we're gonna kind of go through this next information just a little quicker, because we've already talked about it a little bit. Now for the moderate level, you can see inde uh, independent historian has moved into category one. Now you have category two, independent interpretation of tests. And then you have category three, which is that discussion of management or test interpretation. So when we're talking about an independent interpretation, we are talking about a report. Now, it doesn't, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be the same thing as a radiologist or someone like that would do, but it has to be a report to show the difference between you reviewed it and you're actually interpreting it. And then, of course, you would not bill for that separately. Discussion of management, we've kind of talked about that one already. Now we have the high level. Um, and you can see that the change here is you now have to meet two out of the three categories in order to uh, call it that. Now let's talk about risk. And risk really is the one that, that people are having a lot of problems with. Number one, it is the probability or consequences of an event. So if your practitioner is, is saying, I want this patient to take high blood pressure medication, what is the consequences to that event? How is that risky for the patient? Again, that goes back to that proof of thought. You, can, you may have ordered a prescription medication, but you want to look at that risk that from that medication that you may have ordered. Another th question that we get quite often is uh, if you're 
requesting the patient to go to the ER, is that really a determination for hospitalization? Are you the one that's determining the patient needs to be hospitalized, or are you determining that the patient needs someone else to make that decision? So we've just provided you there with the title of the risk category. We have defined morbidity for you, state of illness or injury. We have the straightforward and low risk for you and moderate risk. I wanna to talk to you about the prescription drug management. This one seems to confuse everybody. In your resources section, you have information there where CMS has addressed this question. And because these are examples only, it's not just that your physician ordered a medication or discontinued one or is keeping the patient on the same. It's what is your physician determining is the risk to that patient from the medical decision making concerning the medication that they have made. You, you're gonna have to go back to your physicians on this one. The next ones there talk about major and minor surgery. Again, that's a determination made by your practitioner. For this patient, is it major, is it minor, et cetera? And then we provided you with information here and the link for where the AMA actually talks about um, that prescription drug management. The next thing that we have, and I realize we're getting close on time, we have social determinants of health. We have, um, and, and this procedure code is billed when your physicians and practitioners are using this, they're assessing that information for the medical decision making that they're doing. We have a, a YouTube video that goes into this in more detail, and we will be educating on this again as we move forward. Then we have the high risk, which we've kind of talked about already. Monitoring for toxicity, um, you want to really look at this definition. You're doing some type of testing, <coughs> excuse me, to monitor a drug for the toxicity of the drug, not the efficacy of the drug. And then the information within the CPT talks to you about how that monitoring has to be done. Now we have information on the resources that we have available for you, and you can take a look at those. We've run out of time, and, and I was afraid we were gonna do that, so we're not gonna be able to take live questions. I have seen some uh, questions and things popping up in the chat. We will create a document that will go back out to all attendees for today. Just a couple of quick things, Medicare or CMS, is holding a provider compliance conference, and this is on August 7th and 8th, um, talking about all things compliance. Most of the MACs across the nation will be providing um, some of the breakout sessions that you have, WPS included, and then you've got the link for your agenda and your registration. CMS and Iridian are hosting an all things provider enrollment conference in San Diego on August 28th and 29th, and this will be free. You have the link for your description and your registration. So on behalf of WPS Provider Outreach and Education and Training, and myself and Leanne, we do wanna thank you for attending today. We hope that this provided you with a lot of great information to help make it a little easier to, to work with actually choosing those procedure codes for evaluation and management. We do encourage you to take the survey. We are very interested in your feedback. One of the things you can place on that survey is additional education that you would like to see. We evaluate that. We look at putting that into um, our schedule for the next months. So thank you very much for attending. I hope you guys have an absolute fantastic day. You can now disconnect.